Good evening. I'm B.F. Graham, founder of the Princeton Propellers. And on behalf of the Princeton Area Alumni Association and Quadrangle Club, welcome to tonight's program on the commercialization of electric aircraft travel, Joby Aviation, and the future of urban mobility. I am coming to you from our Battlefield Parkside Studios in Princeton, New Jersey, USA. And tonight's speakers are coming to us from Joby Aviation in Santa Cruz, California. Madeline Matty Barron is an equipment design engineer at Joby, and Daniel Santillan is a software verification engineer. Both graduated with bachelor's degrees from Princeton University's program in mechanical and aerospace engineering. Matty from the class of 2018 and Daniel from the class of 2014. Matty also earned certificates, Princeton's equivalent of minors in robotics and intelligent systems. And Daniel earned certificates in robotics and Latin American studies. With this training, they bring very different aspects of engineering expertise to the exciting work of commercializing EVTOL, electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, a technology poised to transform how we'll commute, travel, and reorganize our urban areas. As an equipment design engineer, Matty supports Joby's aircraft testing teams. She designs and implements component and system level test stands, focuses on structural integrity of the aircraft, and refines designs for their manufacturability. Prior to joining Joby, Matty worked as an advanced programs engineer for Braxton Technologies, where she was program manager for a multi million dollar contract for the US Air Force. She also interned at the Mayo Clinic's Division of Engineering. In her final year at Princeton, Matty received the Enoch J. Durbin Prize for Engineering Innovation from the University for her pioneering work in plasma medicine. We now turn to Daniel's work at Joby. Complementary to Matty's equipment design focus, Daniel deals with a very different engineering aspect, software verification, SV. A seasoned software quality assurance engineer, Daniel has worked at tech and aerospace startups. His first job after Princeton was at UTC Aerospace, followed by several years at 3DR, a maker of enterprise drone software and a designer of commercial and recreational unmanned aerial vehicles. At 3DR, he established and managed their test engineering department. In 2018, he joined Joby as the lead on their SV operations with responsibility for testing multiple types of software releases as the company moves toward EVTOL air taxi certification. So fasten your seatbelts. I think we're in for an exciting ride tonight. And with that, I'll turn the floor over to our two engineers. Take it away, Maddie and Daniel. Great, thank you so much, BFG. Okay. So as BFG said, um, our presentation is called Joby Aviation and the Future of, of Urban Air Mobility. So just a little housekeeping to start off with. This is our legal disclaimer. And we're going to jump right into the exciting stuff with a video of the airplane in action. Your opportunity will be in forward flight voluntarily. Copy.
Awesome. So as BFG said, my name is Maddie Barron and I work at Adobe Aviation. So one thing that we'd like to do to introduce ourselves is to ask if you had an hour of your day back, what would you do with it? And we'd like to ask that because our goal is to save 1 billion people an hour a day on their commutes. So I personally would like to spend a little more time catching up with friends and family on the phone. What about you, Daniel? Good afternoon. Great to see everybody. Uh, I think with my extra hour, I just want to do something outside. So find some sunlight, walk, hike, whatever, lay in the sun. Great. So today we're going to be talking first about the background of Joby, Joby Aviation and then the technology behind our aircraft, how we're going to operate the aircraft, and then a summary at the end. So why are we even focused on electric air taxis? We're solving a fundamental problem in transportation. Congestion is bad and it's getting worse. It's estimated that 4.6 billion hours are wasted in traffic in the US alone. I've noticed personally as I've started commuting back to work and more and more people start commuting back to work that my commute has just gotten longer and longer. And my housemate who also happens to be Prince of 2018 commutes one hour each way to work every single day. Urbanization remains a, a powerful global trend as well. It's estimated that 6 billion people will be living in cities by 2045. All of this makes sustainability more critical than ever. 29% of pollution comes from the transportation sector alone. One way to literally get around this problem is through aerial ride sharing. We can unlock the third dimension of transportation. It can be up to five times faster than driving in major metros. And if your aircraft is all electric, it can also be sustainable. And because of the small amount of infrastructure, it's also replicable on a global scale. So let's take a look at some examples in LA. Take Santa Monica to Burbank, for instance. Driving, it would take 39 minutes, but flying, it would only take 10. And what about downtown LA to LAX? Flying, it would take eight minutes, while driving, it would take 23 minutes. And what about an even longer trip? Hollywood to Palm Springs. The drive time is two hours and 22 minutes, but the flight time is only 52 minutes. I think this slide really illustrates how much longer that driving time is. So what this says to me is that there's a massive untapped market opportunity here. And the great thing about aerial ride sharing, like I said, is that it's replicable on a global scale. LA is just one example. It can be applied to any city that suff suffers from congestion. For example, Princeton is only about 50 miles away from Midtown Manhattan. I remember taking that trip a couple of times when I was an undergrad and the whole thing would take about an hour and a half. Now, if you're flying in an airplane going 200 miles, miles an hour, that's only 15 minutes. So next time you're stuck in traffic, think about how much, you'd, how much you'd rather be flying over it. Great, so meet Joby. We are a vertically integrated transportation company that develops, tests, manufactures, and operates our new aircraft. We plan to launch an app-based rideshare service in 2024, and we have over 800 employees across multiple offices. These include Santa Cruz, San Carlos, Marina, DC, and Munich. So a little history about Joby. Um, we started out in the Santa Cruz mountains uh, near Bonnie Dune, or in Bonnie Dune rather. And uh, I, I still remember my first morning with the company. It was an all hands meeting early Monday morning, had breakfast and all. Uh, and it was at this barn uh, about three years ago, a much smaller company. And one of the things that most impressed me about it was just the beautiful location. Um, and, and one of the big reasons why I joined really is just, you could go for a walk at lunch and, and really just enjoy the, the outdoors. So in 2012, Joby collaborated with NASA on the X-57 Maxwell. It's currently in development. And the goal of the X-57 is to demonstrate that an electric airplane can be more efficient, quieter, and more environmentally friendly than airplanes powered uh, by traditional gas piston engines. Uh, it's just a very cool concept. It's used, um, it uses all electric uh, motors produced by Joby, all on the leading edge of the wing. Uh, all motors are used for takeoff initially, and then only the two outboard motors are used for cruise, while the remaining 12 hold up. The motors on the leading edge also allow the aircraft to operate with a thinner wing, which is more efficient in cruise. Uh, in 2015, Joby developed its first subscale aircraft. Um, it served as a mechanical proof of concept for components like the tilt mechanism, which are so critical for our design, 
Uh, it also helped us learn about some of the early lessons like uh, in aircraft design, in flight testing, and in flight software. Um, 2017 was our first full-scale prototype. And then 2019 was the beginning of the program that really has been taking us uh, till now, which has been our production prototype aircraft. Uh, today, we've had over a thousand test flights on the program. Uh, 2020, we had a couple notable achievements. Uh, firstly, we received our airworthiness certificate from the Air Force, and we were the first EV tool to do so. And then also, we, were, we acquired Uber Elevate in 2020. Uh, and even more exciting, perhaps, was August this year, we went public. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to go to New York with many of my Joby colleagues. I uh, saw our aircraft actually in front of the New York Stock Exchange building. Um, I, I mean, I just remember growing up, hearing about the New York Stock Exchange. Excuse me, I had no idea what a stock was. But then to be able to go to Manhattan, work for the company that is actually going public, it's, it's just a surreal experience. So we'll dig in a little bit more into the technology now. Uh, electric propulsion is brought on a third revolution in aviation. And we just want to talk a little bit about some of the changes. Firstly, uh, where does an EV tool fit in? Um, the big benefits of a fixed wing aircraft are its efficiency and cruise. Uh, by virtue of the wing, of course. Uh, the benefit of a helicopter or, or a multi-rotor is that you have that vertical takeoff and landing capability or VTOL capability. Joby actually takes the best of these worlds, really. We have both the fixed wing and the vertical takeoff capabilities. Um, and it does all this while being quieter and safer. So there are other helicopter charter services, and at least there, there have been in the past. And, but our aircraft really differs in a, in a number of ways. And that key difference is electric propulsion. Um, it allows us to have distributed propulsion, which really just means that our motors are spread out. Uh, it reduces noise, which gives us way better access to urban settings. There's a cost reduction associated with operation and maintenance. And we actually estimate that our cost per mile will be about a quarter of that of the traditional twin engine helicopter. And finally, we have zero emission operations. And then just to summarize some of our aircraft's capabilities. Summarize some of our aircraft's capabilities. We have one pilot and four passengers. Uh, we can take off and land vertically. We operate with zero emissions. We have over 100, we have a range of over 150 miles in addition to the 30 minute required VFR reserve. We have a top speed of 200 miles per hour and we've been developing this aircraft for over 10 years. Thanks, Daniel. So I want to back up for a second and talk about some other vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. I want to talk about this to just really emphasize the importance of having that distributed electric propulsion. So this is the V-22 Osprey, which is a military aircraft that is currently in use. It's a tilt rotor, and so it has two rotors that both can tilt forward and then tilt back up again. And there's one engine that powers each of the rotors, which adds a lot of complexity. For example, in an electric car that's all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive, you have an electric motor in the front and an electric motor in the back. But on your gasoline car that might be four-wheel or all-wheel drive, there's not an engine in the front and an engine in the back. And there's a reason for that, and it's because internal combustion engines are just inherently very complicated. So even though this plane is very cool looking, it had the, complex the complexity led to a lot of reliability and maintenance issues. One stat is that the Marine Corps' Osprey mission-capable readiness was only 53% between the years 2007 and 2010. That means at any one time, only about half of these airplanes were ready for action. Another airplane I want to take a look at is the XC-142A. This one's a little bit different than Joby since it's a tilt wing, but it's also very complicated. As you can see, it has four rotors attached to a wing, and then the wing, the entire wing actually tilts. This one is powered by four engines. And not only that, but it, it just has such a complicated um, drivetrain. And you can see that in this diagram to the left, which is from a maintenance manual. And so not only does that make it really complicated, but it also makes it really loud. It could get up to 132 decibels. And we'll talk about decibels later, but trust me, that's really, really loud. This program was actually pretty successful compared to other vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. It was the first major tilt wing aircraft program. But like the Osprey, it had issues with reliability and maintenance. And even though the program was started in 1962, it was canceled shortly later in 1967. So this brings us to electric propulsion. Electric motors reliability is born out of their simplicity. 
Imagine looking at an internal combustion engine that uses gasoline. There's a lot of stuff going on. And one thing that cracks me up about them is you actually need an electric motor to start an internal combustion engine. You have things like the cooling system, lubrication system, you have pumps, valves, fuel system, exhaust system, whereas with an electric motor, you pretty much just need a cooling system and hook up to a battery and that's it. Their simplicity also makes them a lot smaller. For example, electric cars often have a frunk or a front trunk since they have so much extra room from not having that internal combustion engine. The small size is really important for airplanes because weight is a huge driving design factor. And I would say the most important thing about having the electric propulsion is that it releases, it releases you from the design constraints of having to mechanically connect everything to an engine with drive shafts and gears and all of that. Whereas with electric motors, all you need is a wire to connect it to the battery. So you can easily put the propellers wherever you want and have as many as you want. And that allows the designer to focus on things like safety, reliability, acoustics, aerodynamics, and efficiency instead of the uh, complex mechanical systems. And a happy byproduct of all this is that there are no operating missions. I just think it's so beautiful that the best design for the environment also is the best design in general. So I wanna point out a few key features of our aircraft. We have six tilting propellers, wings, unlike a helicopter, four doors, five seats, a V-tail, which means we have rudder baiters instead of elevators and a rudder. We have battery hatches instead of gas tanks. And it's a carbon fiber composite body and we use additive manufacturing and traditional subtractive manufacturing to make the parts on the plane. So let's take a look at a flight profile since it's pretty unique. So this would be for a vertical takeoff and landing. So first the propellers would be straight up and down and that would allow us to take off straight up. And so we can only, you only have to use the small patch of ground that's the size of the airplane. We don't need a whole runway. And then once we're up in the air, we can accelerate and start to tilt the propellers forward. And tilting the propellers forward is one way that we increase the speed. Oops, clicked on the wrong video. Um, so next we'll go into wing boring flight. And so that is more efficient, which not only makes it more quiet, but it uses less energy. And then play this video again. So when we wanna come in for a landing, the propellers tilt upwards. And then on the final approach, we come in for that landing and the propellers are tilted straight up. And then, like I said, we just need that small patch of space. And I also want to note here that this airplane is also capable of doing a conventional takeoff and landing or seat hole as well. One of the things that inspires me most about coming to work is that we're, we have carbon neutral operations and we're contributing to a carbon neutral future. So here's a statistic from the EPA that shows the total US greenhouse gas emissions by economic sector. And you can see that transportation is 29% of that. And of that 29%, 10% is from aviation. Recently, we were lucky enough to be featured on a PBS Nova documentary. It's called The Great Electric Airplane Race. I think it did a great job of highlighting why the aviation sector needs to work towards being carbon neutral and just to get you excited about it, I thought I'd play the preview here. Planes, a growing part of the climate emergency. Aviation is going to become one of the top polluters if we don't act right now. But could electric power change the equation? Electric motors are within that edge of possible. New technology. Flying taxis or cars. Could decide who wins. We are doing something to change the world. The great electric airplane race. On Nova. Another thing we really pride ourselves on is the fact that our aircraft is 10 times quieter than a helicopter. So this graph shows that a Joby aircraft in cruise is 40 decibels while a conversation about the volume I'm talking now is 60 decibels. A Joby aircraft during takeoff is 65 decibels while a lawnmower is 95 decibels. And don't forget, decibels are on a logarithmic scale. So the pressure waves that are created from the sound of a Joby aircraft and cruise are 100 times less intense 
than the sound, than the pressure waves coming from the sound of a conversation. And likewise, the pressure waves coming from Adobe aircraft can take off for a thousand times less intense than the pressure waves coming from the sound of a lawnmower. And just to highlight again, the that XC142A could get up to 132 decibels. So imagine how loud that would be. In order to show how quiet our airplane is, we created an experiment. We flew two airplanes and three helicopters, as well as Adobe aircraft overhead at the same altitude and speed. Let's take a listen. So the first two you heard, those were aircraft. And generally with the propeller aircraft, they have on the propeller, they have a fast tip speed and a small diameter. So that makes intense high frequency pressure waves, which create that whining noise that you hear. Next up were the three helicopters. Generally, they have a medium tip speed and a large diameter on their rotor, which creates an impulsive, very low frequency pressure waves, which creates that characteristic wop, wop, wop noise of a helicopter. And lastly was the Joby aircraft, which has a slow tip speed and a large diameter propeller, which creates a low intensity, low frequency pressure wave. Not only were we concerned about the volume of the noise, but also the quality. As Joe Ben said, who's our CEO and founder, we set out to develop an aircraft that mimicked natural sounds like the wind in the trees or the sound of the ocean. So let's take one more listen. Thanks, Maddie. Um, one of the topics that keeps coming up is this idea of redundancy. Uh, what is it? Why do we need it? Uh, simply put, it's our ability to handle a failure of a system, so some kind of problem. Uh, we have six pro propellers on board, hence the distributed propulsion. We have two inverters for each propeller, with each inverter being powered by two different battery packs, and then we have four battery packs. This means that the system will still function in the event of a propeller failure, an inverter failure, or even a battery failure. We also have a robust voting system in the software that allows us to detect failures and compensate for the failure. Really, it all adds up to say that we don't have a single point of failure on our aircraft. So let's talk a little bit more about batteries and uh, how they compare to, to some of the other uh, aircraft in the industry. Um, first of all, the Joby airplane is as revolutionary for aviation as the Tesla Model 3 has been for automobiles. So it's really just a, a comparable uh, well-known uh, vehicle. While the automotive industry, the priorities are different. Uh, our battery has a capacity that's double that of the Model 3. Our torque density is six times greater. Our total propulsion is three times that of the Model 3. And we actually have a very similar weight. So aviation is really all about trade-offs and the same is very true for batteries. We have to ba balance both the energy density with the cell lifetime. It's costly to swap out batteries, but we also need enough energy density to be able to fly the 150 mile range that we've advertised and have a reserve. So to do that, we chose to use a lithium ion cell with 811 NMC cathode and graphite anode. It's well-studied technology. It's sold today in cars and power tools. There's sufficient supply for the coming years as we wrap up, ramp up in production. And it also does what we need and is just reliable. There's other new battery technology being developed, which will only make our product better by allowing us to increase payload or range. But while we're working on this technology and we're studying it, it's not ready. So something like lithium metal has better energy density, but it would come with a monthly battery replacement, which doesn't make any business sense. So next I wanna talk about our manufacturing and testing. Adobe is investing in designing, manufacturing, and testing in-house. So we're very vertically integrated. This allows us to do fast engineering iteration cycles and our small scale manufacturing is helping us gain experience for mass manufacturing. All of this gives us higher control and success likelihood over the certification process. So these photos are of our San Carlos facility, which is just outside of San Francisco. And we do a lot of our electronics design tests up there. 
So this leads nicely into what I do for my work. Um, BFG gave a nice description, but I just want to add a little bit to it here. So I'm on the testing team. And as a part of the testing team, I'm, a, I'm on the equipment design team. And what our team does is make any parts for the aircraft that are not the aircraft. So mostly what that ends up being is test stands for the airframe and actuator components. So how do, how do we go about making a test stand? First, I work with test engineers and designers to conceptualize what kind of tests we need to do and how we should do it. So what kind of forces should we put on these airplane components and what should we measure and what configuration should they be in? So once we've discussed that, I'll start to make some drawings like you can see here. And once I have a concept, I'll take that and start to design in our computer-aided design software. And once the design is solid, then I can analyze it to make sure that our design is going to be able to withstand the forces that we're going to be putting on the air, aircraft components. And then I'll refine the design so it's designed for manufacturability and then send it out to get fabricated. And then I get to assemble and build the stand. So this picture on the right here was a proud moment when a test stand finally came together after a lot of work. And it's just really exciting to see that all come together. One type of test stand that my team works on a lot is called a dynamometer, and a lot of people call them dyno for short. This is a, a device that's used to measure the torque and speed of an engine or a motor or basically anything that rotates. So this one in particular in the picture is for the motor that spins the propellers on the aircraft. So it would go between this orange piece and the spiky silver piece. Um, but this is not the only motor on the airplane. Anything that moves needs a motor or an actuator in order to move it. And if it's on the airplane, it also needs to be tested rigorously. So we work on a lot of these dynos. And personally, right now, I'm working on the variable pitch actuator dyno. And the variable pitch, pitch actuator is a device that changes the angle of the propellers. Another innovation of our aircraft is the flight controls logic, which was developed on the F-35. Here's a quick video of our CEO, Joe Ben Bavir, talking about this technology. We've invested a lot of effort and thought into designing unified controls for this aircraft. That means there is simply one directional controller, or inceptor, and one acceleration controller. With electric motors, you don't need to warm up the engines, just press a button and go. The left stick, or inceptor, controls the aircraft acceleration. The right stick controls our altitude, attitude, and direction. There are no rudder pedals for your feet, and if the pilot lets go entirely, the software is designed to keep the aircraft stable. If the pilot pushes the decelerate to hover shortcut button, the aircraft automatically brings itself into a hover over the target landing zone. What we're demonstrating here is that we've developed a system that makes the aircraft really easy to fly. If you try and do something unexpected, the system doesn't let that happen. By automatically managing various flight functions, we're able to materially reduce pilot workload, mitigate common failure scenarios, and leave the pilot free to focus on the mission. Perfect. Just some incredible work that's done there by the controls team at Joby. Um, on that vein, let's go ahead and just review basic fixed wing aircraft controls. Uh, you have a yoke to control your pitch and roll your foot pedals for the yaw, throttle control, switches for something like flaps and landing gear, and then on a helicopter, you'd have the collective to control the rotor blade pitch. So while a traditional aircraft has different control surfaces coupled, the Joby aircraft has the capability to control each actuator directly. So we have rudder vaders, ailerons, flaps, the motor tilt, variable pitch for the propellers as well, and motor torque. So there's just no way for a human being to actually operate that many switches and knobs. And this is really where the unified flight controller comes in. It allows us to extract much of that complexity of flying and gives the pilot the sense that they're playing a video game and just flying around. So on a related note, we've been asked why we haven't opted to fly this aircraft autonomously. Why have a pilot in the first place? So we feel that the public acceptance will be much easier with a pilot on board. It's also easier to certify our aircraft when it's piloted. That being said, we're continuing to work on developing autonomous capabilities for our aircraft and we'll be looking to implement that in the future. I work with two groups at Joby Aviation. The first of these, as mentioned before, was the, is the software verification team. Um, in most of the industry, it's known as more of a quality assurance group. 
So we are responsible for testing all aircraft software and performing all types of different testing. We have regression testing, which is confirming that previously stable features are still working when changes are made. And then we have new feature testing for one of the many software teams. For example, we might work with the previously talked about uh, flight controls team on their software. Does switch A shut off the propellers? Does the return to launch button work as expected? We might also work with a different team like the mission display team where the airspeed is listed for the pilot and we have to make sure that that's working correctly. Or do we have a healthy radio connection with the aircraft? The image shown here is one of my favorite spots at work. Uh, I was sitting there in the ground control station up in, uh, in at, on the hill at Jovi, uh, looking out over the beautiful trees and the valley and the ocean in the distance while my colleague was down at the plane um, and we were working back and forth, playing with radios and whatnot. So just a, one of those beautiful settings. Now the entire company is heavily reliant on many of our test environments and simulators. Uh, the same is true for the software verification team. But as we go down the line for each test environment, it increases in complexity, fidelity, and cost. You have your basic unit tests, which developers are, are very familiar with. Then you go down to like software in the loop simulators where we can use that automated flight and, and set up automated tests. Each developer can also have their own uh, automated, excuse me, their own software in the loop simulator at their desk and better test their code. Then you might go down to a hardware in the loop simulation, which is actually shown in the image here. Um, and we have aircraft hardware, generally speaking, and it, it's, it was shown perfectly in the video that Joe Ben talked about with uh, unified flight controls. Then you might go to Ironbird, which is a term used in a lot of aviation companies. It's essentially a stripped down airplane with actuators. And finally, of course, you have the full, air, full scale aircraft, which you might have testing as well as the, the flight test work. Secondly, the, uh, the other group that I work with is the data analytics team. During testing and flight with the simulators and the aircraft, we generate an enormous amount of data. We have dozens of computers on board that are communicating with each other constantly. Data analytics works to make sense of that data. We create automated tests to find problems with the aircraft and test platforms. Did one of the radios cut off during flight? Did a computer reboot during flight? Because of the redundancy in the system, we can handle these issues, but we don't always have a way of knowing that they happened in the first place and obviously we want to correct them. Performance monitoring is another aspect of it. It means that we track the results of the key, key metrics over time and tests and make sure that they aren't changing. So if we see an uncharacteristically high radio traffic this month, then we want to know. Finally, we'll assist developers by providing them with digestible analyzed data and working on creating dashboards, plots, and debugging any kind of issues. So now we'll go ahead and just talk a little bit about the operation side of the aircraft. How are we saving a billion people an hour a day? We're building an integrated service that allows our customers to open a smartphone app, press a button, and get to their destination up to five times faster. It's called aerial ride sharing. Step one, much like an Uber app, you would select your destination on the mobile app. Step two, the Joby service will plan your route and take you to the nearest Skyport. Part three, take a Joby flight to your destination, the fun part of course, up to 150 miles away and at speeds of up to 200 miles per hour. Finally, you exit the Skyport and take your second rideshare car to your final destination. So next I'm gonna talk about the technology and data analysis behind how we choose the Skyports and how we create a seamless trip for our customers. I think this is one of the most unique and fascinating things about going on at Joby, and it's not publicized or talked about that much, so I'm really excited to share it with you. This knowledge and area of expertise at Joby comes from our acquisition of Uber Elevate, which was Uber's urban air mobility branch. And a key insight that came from Uber Elevate's work is the need for true multimodality, which is the seamless connection between ground and air transportation. Let's again use LA as an example. This diagram is pre-pandemic data about the overall movement across LA. There's almost 50 million trips per day, but what do we do with all this data? We have to ask some key questions. And one of the big ones is, for all these trips that are happening, how many people would want to take a Joby and how much would they be willing to pay? You can see some of the options here. Uber Elevate came up with a model that can predict the answer to this question. What they did is they commissioned an extensive set of preference surveys and calibrated it against Uber data. And then they turned that into a model that predicts customer price sensitivity for any potential trip someone might take. 
So now Joby can use this model to estimate how many people would take the Joby service at a, partic at a particular price point. For instance, let's just look at a simple two Skyport network between Hollywood and LAX. Now we can use this model that, that I just described to estimate how many people based on today's preferences would actually book the Joby surface service at a given price. For example, at $3 per passenger mile, we predict the demand to be about 300 trips per day. And now we can use that same approach across the entire region to design an optimal network serving the greatest demand with the fewest skyports. But there are practical realities that constrain the implementation of an idealized network. One big one is airspace operation and rules. This map shows one day of helicopter traffic around LA. It represents only about 10% of the overall traffic that the FAA tracks. There's an air traffic control system that governs this type of flight activity. And in a region like LA, it is both complex and vital to the public interest. There are three dimensional layers of airspace classes as well as air traffic control sectors. And we must design our network in the context of these, constra these constraints. Now let's look at a five Skyport network. If the price point is $4 per passenger mile, we predict we could capture 3,400 trips per day with 30 aircraft. But that idealized network needs to be adjusted to, to fit in with the FAA airspace rules. When we increase the number of ports to, of Skyports to 12, we predict that at $4 per passenger mile, there would be a demand for 12,500 trips per day. And we could serve that with about 120 aircraft. And as we scale the network out, we can add longer routes such as LA to Palm Springs and LA to San Diego. With both best in class range and operating cost, the Joby aircraft can effectively serve both long and short routes. And this allows us to further unlock latent demand. And as demand continues to develop, we can both extend and fill in the network, reducing first and last mile times and increasing overall demand. Here we've added an additional set of Skyports to bring the total to 22. If we lower the price to $3 per passenger mile, the result is over 40,000 trips per day, and it could support a network of over 300 aircraft. So all this helps us determine the routes with the most demand, what people would be willing to pay, and how many planes we would need. It also helps us determine the ideal location for skyports. So besides airspace, we're taking into account additional real world constraints, such as how easily cars can access the skyports to drop off and pick up customers. Here are, the, here are some dots showing where skyports would be in this model. Choosing the locations for these skyports was made possible by the tools developed at Uber Elevate. In order to make these skyports a reality, we can leverage our key partnerships. Earlier this year, we announced our partnership with Reef and Neighborhood Property Group. Reef is transforming parking garages all over the country, and we believe that the tops of these assets are particularly important for aerial ride sharing. They're flat, they don't need any structural reinforcement, and they have easy car access. The agreement that we have with them allows us to access more than 4,500 parking garages and mobility hubs. Another big aspect to consider is the certification work. Uh, getting an aircraft certified is just a monumental effort. They say that the certifying an airplane, you need the weight of the paperwork to be more than the plane itself. Um, one of the first things we had to determine was how to categorize our aircraft. Is it a plane? Is it a helicopter? Is it something totally new and novel? Really, the answer is yes to all of these things, but for FAA, FAA certification purposes, our aircraft is a plane, which means that we're using Part 23, which has a lot of benefits. Pilots are widely available. There are over 5,000 existing airports, heliports across the U.S., and the airplane will operate under existing rules and standards. We don't need new policies. We don't have to use outdated helicopter rules. We completed our certification basis in 2020, which is another way of saying that we, we finished agreement with the FAA and, and, and how we should certify. We kind of got on the same page, if you will. Um, we're currently working on flight testing and we'll be working on pre-certification operations. And then 2023 will be a big year for us. We'll have our production facility online and we expect to receive our FAA type certification. The big question then is when will you be able to ride in a, in a Joby? We're targeting a commercial service launch in 2024. In closing, Joby is building a revolutionary, cost-effective, and clean global transportation system to fulfill our vision of saving a billion people an hour a day. 
Now just one more video because I don't think you've gotten enough of our beautiful aircraft. Thanks for listening, everybody. Back to you, BFG. Maddie and Daniel, thank you both. We now turn to the Q&A portion of our program, which as previously announced, will be limited to 15 minutes. This is a good time to remind those of you who may have tuned in late that your participation confirms your consent to be recorded and appear in all online publications and rebroadcasts of this propeller. Now, we usually give priority to questions which have been sent in in advance. So let me begin uh, with the first one we received. And it has to do with uh, how, will, how will your aircraft uh, interface with air traffic control? I think obviously we need to follow the rules that the FAA has in place already. And beyond that, I don't know if we can talk to that. Daniel, do you wanna add anything? Yeah, I, I don't know that I have any, um, any great answer to that either, but as mentioned before, you know, we're operating under part 23, so we are essentially an airplane. Um, so in that regard, I believe we'd be operating under any other restrictions for, for general aviation. Okay, our next question has to do um, with Skyports. Which cities uh, have been most receptive or do you expect to be most receptive to having them? We have not announced any of our uh, partner cities yet. Okay. Um, then departing from that slightly, um, the next question is, I've read that in some instances, Skyports will actually not be needed because some aircraft will eventually be able to operate practically door to door. In that case, will drones be part of the uh, equation? Um, maybe it's not a little bit too part of a question there. Uh, regarding door to door, I'm sure it's certainly possible. Um, the idea with our service is it we uh, it, we're we're expecting to run our own operation, so I, I don't expect these to be privately owned. Um, so yeah, it seems unlikely they would be going to your doorstep, but somewhere nearby. Um, oh, I think uh, the person who sent in the question meant something along the lines of what they would be able to land in your yard, pick you up and take you someplace else. That's a bit futuristic, but apparently that's down the road. Yeah, I think, I think the technology is certainly there uh, on the operation side. I don't know that we have an answer for that. Yeah, um, right now we're planning on operating with Skyports and uh, we have to operate within the existing airspace rules. So there's rules about like where, you know, airplanes and helicopters can land. So we'll have to operate within those existing rules. Well, that leads beautifully into the next question, which is uh, what types of certification and for which agencies will Joby need to obtain permission before the fleet can fly? And please describe certification requirements and how they vary among agencies that are state, federal, and overseas. 
to my understanding, we only have to work with the FAA as far as certification um, and regulation in the United States. Uh, you have certainly other sort of other agencies like YASA in, in Europe and other places. Um, I, I'm not sure that uh, I can speak to which agencies or what certifications we would need specifically. For my side, um, I mean, as I mentioned, part 23 is a big part of it, so being certified as an airplane. The hardware side, totally different rules that are that are being um, are being followed very closely. But for the software side, we are uh, working with part 107. Uh, which dictates a lot of our software um, and the verification process that, that has to be accompanied with. Another interesting part of that too is that since we'll be operating our own aircraft, we have to also be certified as a, like an, air, an airplane service. Um, so that's another part of the certification as well. Okay, we, uh, we have a question from uh... Blair Woodward Ayers, uh, she wants to know if you're able to tell us uh, which markets you plan to launch in. Um, like I said earlier, we haven't announced any of our partner cities yet. Okay. I thought I'd try again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I have a question about uh, financial availability. Uh, will this technology be financially available to a wide consumer base? and who are the, the target customers who might be able to afford it? Yeah, definitely. Um, so the, the goal is for it to be about the same price as a Uber Black. I think I'm saying that right, Daniel. It's like the, it's the fancy Uber. Um, that's okay, right. he's nodding. Um, that's good. Um, so yeah, our goal is to make it an affordable option for everybody. We don't want it to be something that's just for the wealthy. We want it to be an option that everyone considers when they look at their commute or look at you know, getting to an airport or traveling somewhere for the day. And, oh, sorry. Um, and then the prices that I was naming in the slides about Uber Elevate's uh, technology tools, those are um, the range of the prices that we're considering. It's also important to note that that's also assuming we're at scale. Um, I think uh, uh, we, we need a large fleet to make this feasible for, for ourselves and for our customers. Are you able uh, to say um, what's going on in China with this technology? Um, I don't think we should comment on other people's ventures. I can say there's a lot of other players in this space though. We're not the only ones. Uh, yes, I've, I've read that, and uh, they're in a number of countries, actually. So our viewers can uh, consult Google and find out the answer to that question in more detail. Uh, and finally, the last question I have uh, from somebody is, this is a fun question. What does it feel like? Does it feel like riding in a glider? I, I think I can speak for Maddie in saying that neither of us have actually ridden in uh, one of our aircraft. Really? Uh, yeah, really. Um, but uh, I've heard good things. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it, you know, the, the goal is to make it as smooth a ride as possible um, and to, uh, to make it a very comfortable and pleasant experience. So um, not a lot of sudden movements, uh, comfortable cabin, all that. Um, but yeah, I, I actually can't speak to that. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to when I can ride in it. Um, we're an experimental aircraft right now and I, uh, you know, we want to make it as our, one of our big goals is safety. Um, and that's something we take really seriously. So until it's certified, I don't think uh, Daniel and I will be riding in it. So it sounds like at a minimum, we're a couple of years away from being able to ride in one of your aircraft. Is that about right? Yes. Well, type certification will be 2023 and then commercial operations in 2024. So fingers crossed. Well, You've given us something wonderful to look forward to. I can't wait to have my first ride. <laughs> so uh, with that, our thanks to Matty and Daniel for tonight's program on the future of urban mobility. What a journey. We also thank our attendees, an ever-growing audience of entrepreneurs, navigators, and the curious. Until we meet again, you can reach us by emailing propellers at princetonaaa.org. 
We love hearing from you and welcome your suggestions for speakers who, thanks to Zoom, can be anywhere in the world. Our next Second Tuesday's Propeller Flight is scheduled for November 9th, 7 p. Eastern U.S. time, when we'll learn about a revolutionary approach to cancer treatment, combining cell fate reprogramming and immunotherapy. Please mark your calendars. And now, wherever you are in Asia, Oceania, Europe, Africa, or the Americas, it's time to bid farewell. Until we meet again, this is B.F. Graham on behalf of the Princeton Propellers, signing off and wishing you high spirits and happy landings. <laughs>